Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you will only allow what is supposed to be said comes out of this mouth of clay. I commit to you and yield to you this morning. I pray for fresh manna, live, transforming manna, that we will see progress to the greater, to the more glorious this week than last week. We thank you for all the progresses that we've made by your grace, by your Holy Spirit. And we're looking for more progress. You have called us to be greater. You have called us to be glorious. So we want to walk in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. While you turn to it, or while you're looking out on the screen, I want to set it up and make an introduction. You know, I, was, um, I heard a, a really famous leader said this one time uh, when he was teaching other leaders how to be leaders, you know, like I, I'm, I'm still learning, you know. And I heard he said this so powerfully. He's a Christian leader, and, and um, uh, he said, when you, look, when you see someone that is very successful, had great accomplishments, don't make the mistakes that everybody is making. Is try to follow what that person is doing. For example, as a young preacher, the tendency and temptation for me is to look at other preachers and follow what they do. Like successful one. You know, you see a very successful preacher, you preach at him, you, you have a big smile on your face. You become like that preacher and you, 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 you be like him. But God has never called e any one of us to follow anyone. He called us to follow him. So the tendency and temptation is for us to follow them. Or if you're in the investment market, you know, they say, you know, I, I always, because I invest quite avidly in the, in the market, you know, and has been doing that for the past 25 years. And, and so the, the mistake I made was listening to those news articles that tell me what Warren Buffett is investing in. They would say, Warren Buffett is investing in this, or Carl Icahn, or whatever his name is, is investing in this, and so therefore you follow it. See, the mistake is for people to do that. See, you would never know when Warren Buffett is selling. So after he sold, and you never know it, and you just follow the news, and then the market tank, and you go, well, what happened? Well, what happened is that you didn't know he sold. You only find out probably three months later. You never know when he bought. When he bought it was really cheap, but now it's like at the peak and you just follow, you are gonna get hurt. So don't follow what successful people do. But this is what you do. You try to observe and figure out how they think. Did you get that? Don't follow what they do. You're not called to do what they do. You could be very talented in programming computer. So don't try to be in sales. And for the sales guys, don't try to be a technical guy. You'll be miserable either way, right? You just travel in your lane. But what you do is you want to learn from people who are successful. The way you learn from them is you observe how they think. In other words, how they make decisions, how they, how they process information. You observe closely what these people are doing. I admire my uh, father-in-law a lot, um, but you know he's a cook. And I, the only thing I know how to do is to fry an egg. And it may be some instant noodle, who knows, right? And put a hot dog on the grill or whatever, right? I don't even know how to grill the chicken properly because it's never cooked properly, you know? It's always burnt outside and it's like raw inside, right? But, you know, I don't try to do what he's doing or had been doing his life. I observe how he thinks in terms of finances, in terms of managing his business, how he became so successful financially. And so I observe and I follow what he's trying to think. Now, when I was a young kid, uh, the way I followed Jesus was I follow what, the, what, uh, what people told me about Jesus. In other words, his story, the story of Jesus, you know, from the manger all the way to resurrection. I follow the story of Jesus, which is great because I will have a general picture of what that is. 
As I get older, I begin to go deeper in that I follow his teaching, which is great. Because, you know, if you want to learn about the, the, the truth and the Word of God, you follow the Word of God. You follow the teaching, especially the teaching of Jesus. It's so powerful. You know, I always like to spend a lot of time on the four Gospels. Just not so that I can just, you know, t- read the story, but I can follow his preaching. You know, Jesus is the best preacher. Yes or no? I mean, other preachers are great too. We have a lot of great preachers and we follow many great preachers. I listen to great preachers, but the best preachers is, the best preacher is Jesus. He is an amazing preacher. And so if you follow his preaching, you can learn many things. But you know, lately, I had been observing his behavior what he's doing. And then we started talking about that, you know. Jesus said, you know, I, I won't do what the Father is not doing. I won't say what the Father is not saying. Before I do any, anything, I would check with the Father. It sounded that way. And that's good because now I'm observing Jesus' behavior. I follow his behavior. I'm not following other preachers, other successful men and women's behavior. I follow this Son of God, God himself, his behavior, which is great. And the Bible says, be holy even as I'm holy. Yes? yes. Amen. Lately, in fact, this week, of, not this week, I mean, some time ago, the Holy Spirit says, now observe how I think. If you follow how I think and you think like the way I think, you will do great things. So I started to observe the thinking of the Lord. And so this morning, I want to share with you a little bit, kind kind of get you going, get you started, how to begin to observe the way Jesus thought when he was on earth, and he thinks today because he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He didn't change his mind when he went to heaven. He didn't change his mind when he rose from the dead. He is the same yesterday, today, and... Tomorrow. So how he thought on earth that is recorded in the word of God is how he is thinking today. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to go through a few lists. And I promise you I'll be be, uh, efficient in my time. It's 11.56 on my clock. So I will let you out of here as soon as possible. But I want to get you started. No, you don't want to get out of here as soon as possible? So I'll give you some examples. And, um, and then we can get started how Jesus thinks. And I tell you this, when you understand how Jesus thinks, you will read the word differently. You know, let me stay on this introduction a little bit. I forgot to mention this. When you read the Bible, each and every one of us, when we read the Bible, we read it in a certain way. We read it from the lenses of the people that had taught us the Bible. Yes or no? We read, doesn't matter who it taught you. So if you are, so you, if you're in the, from a, a denomination, I'm not knocking denomination, I love every denomination. So I love every denomination, okay? So even if you're Anglican or Presbyterian or Frozen Chosen, whatever, I love you. You just, God loves you so much. It's awesome. But you know, we, each, each denomination has their lens of doctrine. You know what that means, right? Doctrine. The way they believe how the Bible is trying, what the Bible is trying to convey. So they teach from the lens of their doctrine. You know, if you're suspicious guys, you know, always think about conspiracy theory, you would think that they would teach from their agenda. But I don't believe that. I think there are a lot of sincere people. Yes, there are some crooks, whatever, but praise God. The Holy Spirit will teach you and show you the way. But every denomination, every teachers that you hear on television, every evangelist that you hear on television, every good preacher, they all are sincere and well-meaning, but they all have their lenses, i.e. their revelation. And so they are teaching you from the revelation. Is it bad? I didn't say it is bad. I'm just saying there is some sort of lenses that you are seeing the word of God through. But if you can read the Bible through the lens of Jesus, it's like, whoa, amazing. Let me give you one example. Growing up as an evangelical, you know, 
you know who you are, evangelical, right? And Pentecost or whatever. We were told of this story that Jesus said, this parable, this illustration that Jesus used, talking about the end time. He said that in that day, when the Son of Man should reveal himself, for those who are in the field, don't go back to your house. For those who are at the rooftop, don't come back down. And then he proceeded to say that one will be taken, another will be left behind. Have, do you remember that? How many of you remember that? You raise your hand at me, okay? So I, I know who I'm talking to. So in that lens, the evangelical lens, who believe in what we call the pre-tribulation rapture. You know what that is, right? You know, you know like uh, that, that rapture movie that Nicolas Cage is in. What's it called? Left behind, you know, that, that, that is that, that narrative. If you believe in that narrative of pre-tribulation rapture, you know, you say, Pastor, do you believe that? Well, I do. And, but, you know, like I'm open, I'm not, I'm not dogmatic in this area because I know I'm going to heaven. I don't know what happened, but I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah, right? So, so you could be mid-trip or post-trip or whatever. Whatever trip you want to be in, go for it, right? But it's not important. But in the pre-trip narrative, they use that as somebody has been raptured. Remember that? Now, if you read the whole Bible in context, not from that lens, you will realize that the one that had been taken, taken, the one that's been raptured, gets thrown into the fire. <laughs> It's like, what? <laughs> yeah. So there are many other examples in the Bible that have been preached out of context to, you know, you can slice the Bible any way you want to fulfill your agenda. So if you have a certain things that you want to justify, I, I can guarantee you, you can find a statement, even a murderer. A murderer can say, see, God told David to go kill those people. Therefore, aha, let's go charge, slaughter. You, you can justify anything in the Bible if you take things out of context. The Word of God, the Bible, is not always what God says. Ooh. It's a recording of events. It's not what God instructs. I shouldn't say God said. It's not what God is instructing us. So when David committed adultery, God is not trying to tell us we commit adultery. Are you here? Amen. It's just an event. But you can take things out of context and say, see, this is in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, it's holy. No. Are you here this morning? I'm not going to give you an extreme example, but I'm just trying to show you that the danger is sometimes very subtly we are looking at the truth from some lenses that are distorted somewhat. I shouldn't even say distorted. Somewhat, somewhat not a, an exact, clear, original view. is somebody else's revelation, however great they may be. Because we are, we are reading or hearing the word through the lenses of some other people's teaching. But this is the days and hours that the people of God, listen to this, are waking up to the truth that they have the Holy Spirit in them and the Holy Spirit is teaching them. Teaching them the truth. So don't be bound by a certain theology, bound by a certain doctrine. Be free in Jesus' name. Are you here this morning? Now, I'm not preaching heresy, telling you that, oh, okay, everything all goes. You know, people, there's people that tell, you know, they always say, the Lord tells me. Every time when they want to justify the behavior, they say, the Lord tells me. Especially when they want to leave a church. It's okay. When God tells him, I believe that. You know, praise the Lord. But oftentimes, sometimes, not all the time, it's not the Lord tells you anything. It's you trying to justify your behavior. I would hear young people come to me and say, you know, the Lord told me to marry this person. Well, it's not true. But now these days, I keep my mouth shut because I, you know, who am I to meddle? <laughs> I don't meddle anymore. I threw the key away. If the Lord tells you, no, just have out. go for it. You will have my cheering. It's like, I'm here to comfort, to lift up, to protect, I'm not here to judge, condemn, and make you feel awful. 
Uh, yeah, no, that's my, my goal in life, you know. And, and when you leave this place, this is my dream. And my, every morning I come now, I am very conscious about the fact that we, when you leave this place, you are lifted up. You have greater revelation of who you are. You have greater revelation of who God is. You have greater revelation of His mercy and His grace. You have greater revelation of His power and miracles is available to you. You have greater revelation of anything. You know, there are people that just want to hear one type of truth. You know, they, they want to hear one type of teaching, and they're not open to any other teaching. They, they're trying to identify. You know, a lot of people who come visiting this church, they're trying to identify who I am. Is he like Pentecostal, Word of Faith, Baptist, Presbyterian? What is he? And is he Republican, Democrats, uh, NDP, liberals, conservatives? You will have a hard time figuring that out. Hallelujah. I'm not drawing any line on the sand. Glory to Jesus. The only line I draw is Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He loves you and he's madly in love with you. Hallelujah. You say, well, are you talking about permissive, being permissive of sin? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the grace of God is greater than your weaknesses. Whatever you struggle with, his grace will deliver you. Not my words. Not my words. Never my words. His grace will give you a sufficiency to have become an overcomer. Hallelujah. Anyways, back to my teaching. All right. So I want to show you how Jesus thinks and how he thinks. And hopefully when you read the Bible, you will begin to observe how he thinks. All right? Now let's first go to the first one. It's Mark chapter 1. Sorry. Let's go to Mark chapter 13. And as he came out, Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see this amazing buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown out. Wow, so negative. <laughs> Pouring cold water on the amazing architecture. Is that what he's trying to do? You see, Jesus thinking, Jesus not, not, does not think and make judgment on the present and the now. What Jesus sees is what the end game is. A lot of us are fascinated with what is being presented now or being negative of what's being presented now. Either way, we make judgment call based on what is the present. What Jesus is doing is that he is focusing always on the ultimate end game, the final outcome. For this temple in, uh, example, they just see and being at awe of what this amazing building is. I mean, I can preach about that, about, you know, building, but, you know, I'm not talking about that anymore, just for some other time. But they see this amazing infrastructure, this amazing building. They get blown away. Wow. But what Jesus saw was the finality of what that building will become. The end game. Now, watch this. Whatever the state you are in today, that may not be good. So I'm kind of twisting it around, right? Many of us make judgment call on people because we are not very impressed with where they're at today or how they behave today. What we need to do is to think like Jesus thinks. He would see what the end result is. You know, when the disciples all took off on him, he did not see the disciples as failures, except Judah. He didn't see them as failures. He continued to teach them and continued to plan that they will be awesome. All those disciples that he picked, they all have flaws and mistakes. Jesus was not paying attention to the flaws and mistakes they're making, the present weaknesses they have. What Jesus saw was after the Holy Spirit was upon them, they would be completely transformed, and they will transform and rock and change the world. What Jesus sees in you is not what you are today. What he sees in you is the final product. The Bible 
Bible says that he that had begun a good work in you will faithfully complete it. So what he sees in you right now is not where you at, how you behave, but what he sees in you is what you will be when he's done with you. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's awesome. It's world changing. And so don't let anybody put you down because of where you're at, because of the struggles you're at, especially the devil. He is the accuser of the brethren. Say, hey, you're no good. Don't let him silence that voice and say, Jesus is still working in me. By the time I'm finished, devil, you're going to be running. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's what our destiny is. That's what we are called to do. So don't let people judge you or allow you to judge yourself based on where you're at. Look at yourself as Jesus would see you. The final product. The ooh, the refiner fire that would put it through to become God. Oh, to become beautiful. That's what he sees. So next time when you see something, someone you're not very happy with, don't make judgment call on them. Shaka. Because Jesus sees the final product in them. On the other hand, don't be so impressed with beautiful buildings today. You know, me and my wife... I, growing up, I always admired Robert Schuller. You know who that guy? He just passed away. His son is actually on t- His grandson is on TV now. And uh, I'm always very amazed. I read his book, you know, because he had this beautiful crystal cathedral. You know what that, you know what, Christian? So when we went to Los Angeles, of course, the first thing, San Francisco, uh, California, the first thing we do is crystal cathedral. We got to go. I was telling my wife, we got to go, you know. We're looking for it, you know. Went there and went in there, took some pictures, like, whoa, look at that. You <laughs> know, like a tourist in New York. <laughs> they say, if you don't want to look like a tourist in New York, just don't do like this. <laughs> I mean, the first time I went to New York as a young 20 year old, 22 years old, doing business in New York, the company sent me down to New York, you know. And I heard so much about New York, never been there, never seen the Grand Station, never seen other that Metro. Life uh, building, never seen anything, right? So I was down there, young rookie, you know, just. So the guy who was accompanying me said, Stop it, we're gonna get robbed. What, what do you mean? You look like a tourist. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, went to Crystal Cathedral. Whoa, look at it. Wow, this is amazing. Just a few years ago, they had to sell the building because they went bankrupt. Don't look at what is present now. Especially things that are materialistic. Don't be too impressed with it. However beautiful your car is today, I'm not calling Paul in cold water. I just want to put some right perspective. However beautiful your Porsche, whatever you're driving out there, however beautiful, one day it will be rusty. Are you here this morning? Shut up. So don't get too impressed with this physical thing because they will too shall come to pass. The only thing that will last is what you have in Christ Jesus. So don't be impressed. You know, like, you know, people really impressed with materialistic thing. I tell you, I own a home. I tell you, you got to constantly upgrading it. It's like you just leave it alone for a couple of years. It's starting to fall apart. Got a constant, it's like, they call it money pit, you know, just keep pouring money into it. It's like, oh. Anyway, let's move on. Now, let's go to John chapter, actually, you don't have to go, it's a reference. John chapter 4, verse 126. So, Jesus was at this, this uh, well. She was, she was physically tired, and he was thirsty. So, he was sitting down right beside this Samaritan woman was drawing water. You all know the story. And Jesus went, you know, can you give me some water? She said, well, you know, I don't have any blah, 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 whatever excuse. And Jesus said, if you know who is asking you for the water, the one who can give you everlasting water, she went, you don't even have a bucket. What do you mean you give me everlasting water? So Jesus proceeded to now ministering to her. You, when you have a chance, go home and read it. It's pretty amazing, right? And, and, and the woman continue to focus on the physical water when Jesus had switched channel talking about her thirsty soul. 
You know why her soul is thirsty? She had seven husbands, and the one that she was living with is not her husband. When you have to repeat things that many times, whatever vices it is, whatever things that you need to keep doing it, it is an indication. It's not condemnation. I'm not judging you. It's an indication of some thirst that can never be satisfied. Once you go through the third round, if it's not working, it means whatever that you're looking for to satisfy you ain't there. Did you get that? So this woman had tried seven marriages and it didn't work and she's trying something else right now, living with another man. Jesus never said a word of condemnation or judgment to her. You notice that? She said, how dare you? How could you live with seven men? I'm not saying Jesus permitted that. But what Jesus saw was that what's behind that, that, that lifestyle is not because this woman wake up in the morning and go, let me see how I can sin against God. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, what can I do to offend God this morning? We do what we do because we need to satisfy certain things in our life. You're so quiet. We do what we do because we, whatever it is that you are doing, that you need, you keep needing it so much. Like Matthew, you know, he, he just loved to play with video games. Something needs to be satisfied there. <laughs> Poor baby, sorry. <laughs> Look at me, Dad. I still owe Kristen 50 cents. Oh, that was last week, right? Yeah. So if you keep doing something that is because you need to satisfy, and Jesus saw this woman, Jesus was not looking to judge her. Jesus was looking, listen, to satisfy her. So Jesus said, I have water that will fill up so much that you will be so satisfied. You do not need crutches or substitutes. If there are certain things in your life that you keep doing because you, are, you don't even know that you're doing it to satisfy something, turn that attention now to the Lord. He has living water to satisfy you. He's not here to judge you and condemn you for trying your best to satisfy a certain thirst in your life. He understands that and he wants to satisfy that thirst. He's not here to condemn you because you're trying to satisfy a certain yielding and thirst. He came to die on the cross to free us from the bondage of sin. Why? So that he can satisfy us in the area where we are thirsty and hungry. Did you get that? Amen. Let me do one more. John chapter 3. You know the Bible said that Nicodemus came to Jesus. I have a few more here, but you know, I'm running out of time. So this is the last one. So Nicodemus was having a conversation with Jesus. Nicodemus says, you know, came to Jesus and before he even asked the first question, maybe, maybe they had some, some small chat that wasn't recorded. But Jesus, you know, was sitting there and Nicodemus come and the first thing Jesus said to him is, you're going to be born again. Huh? What? And so they went, went and back and forth about what is born again. So later on Jesus said, if I try to explain to you earthly things that you don't even understand, Jesus considered being born again is an earthly thing. Isn't that deep? It's not even a spiritual thing. It's not even a heavenly thing. You see, in heaven, you don't need to be born again. Are you here? You do not need to be born again in heaven. But on earth, you do have to be born again. So, that's what Jesus said. If I try to explain your earthly things, you don't even understand. How are you going to understand heavenly things, which is like 10 trillion times more sophisticated, right? So, Nicodemus is trying to understand. Watch this. What Jesus is trying to tell him spiritually through the lens of his physical knowledge. You would never be able to square 
what Jesus is trying to teach you if you try to understand his teaching through the lens of your physical knowledge. In other words, science will never be able to explain the truth in terms of in spiritual matters. Science can't do it. Because here Nicodemus is trying to square what Jesus is saying. He said, what do you mean I need to be born again? Should I go into my mother's stomach and come out again? And Jesus is trying to explain to you, unless you be born in the spirit of water. And you know, the conversation did not record all the details of the conversation. The Bible didn't record all the details of the conversation. But I'm sure it's a lot more in-depth than what was said. Because, you know, Nicodemus is like, what, what do you mean? I mean, if I was Nicodemus, like, what do you mean born of water? What do you mean born of spirit? What spirit? Who is the spirit? How does it work? Right? But if you try to understand spiritual manner from the lens of your physical knowledge, which, by the way, is very limited. I don't care how smart you are, how, how, how much of a rocket scientist you are, your knowledge is still limited in compared to the existence of the entire universe. They say they just discover how many more galaxies in the universe. Some of you who are like in tune with the news. Many more galaxies. It's huge. It's huge. (laughs) It's big. Trying to understand. How do you try to square God using our pittance little mind that is from this pittance little planet? To understand a God who created something much bigger than the universe. How do you square that? So this is what Jesus is trying to convey. If you're trying to square or understand what is spiritual. And that's why a lot of times I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned when people try to debate with unbelievers. You know how people try to debate with unbelievers? I mean, bless your heart, if they're trying their best. If you try to understand spiritual matters through logics, you're going to bump your head in the wall every single time because it will become illogical. The more you follow, so what you need to do is get out of that mode because that's what the world wants to tempt us to. Even religious people. You see, religion, they try to make things in logical steps. Rules are actually logical steps. It's easier to comprehend. But God is calling you and I to a deeper level. It's beyond logics. It's called faith. It's, it's called spirit. So every time you read the Bible, you can read it the way it is, or you can read it the way that God thinks. How do you, how do, you do that? Father, th- number one, teach me how you think. Show me. He will reveal it to you. And number two, teach me, Lord. Teach me. Show me the way. And so what Jesus thinks, he wasn't thinking based on human logic, thinking of spiritual logic. The last one, and this is a bonus, then I'm going to close. Debbie, could you come out? We're going to get ready to close. Jesus spoke to his disciples at the time, at the end of his ministry. He said, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Remember that? And then after that, everybody took off. Like, what? What do you mean, you cannibal? Oh, like, eat your flesh and drink your blood. And Jesus says, are you going to leave too to the disciples? Because what Jesus was teaching and saying, it's so illogical, it became, watch this, offensive. Many people are offended by what is being preached and said to the point that they allow the offense to turn away from the truth. Religion then teach, you know, when you take communion, the bread and the wine actually went through a metamorphosis of some kind. They call it transubstantiation theology. Is that the bread you eat becomes Jesus' flesh. All of a sudden, it becomes flesh. And the wine you drink all of a sudden becomes Jesus' blood. It was never taught in the Bible. It's this human try to square what is spiritual. It won't work. However amazing it may sound. Besides that, in the Catholic Church, God bless them. Only the priests get to drink the blood. The rest of us just get our body healed, but only the priests get the washing of the blood, you know. 
right? In the Catholic Church, only the priests drink the, the cup, right? Well, it depends on what Catholic Church you go to. Because I remember when I graduated from St. Michael's College in U of T, that's what happened. I was thinking to myself, how come he gets to drink all the wine, you know? Where's my share? He just gave me the emblem. Father, we come before you this morning. I pray that we become observer of the way you think. That we no longer think like the way that human thinks. But we observe how you think by observing how Jesus thinks. Let me say one more thing. One more thing. Sorry. You know, when Jesus was on earth, he said, I will not do what the Father is not doing. I will not say anything the Father is not saying. You remember I preached about that? What does that mean? What does it mean? Is the Father healing people up, up in heaven? Is the Father walking on water? No. The Father wasn't, there's no, he's not walking in a storm in heaven. What he's saying is that I know exactly how my Father thinks. I in him, he in me. It's the same thing as we today. If you want to follow Jesus, don't follow what he did. Don't try to walk on your swimming pool and you'll drown if you don't know how to swim. I heard a story of kids, little kids trying to, it's so funny, it's for Christian entertainment, I guess. Bunch of youth, you know, circling around the swimming pool. And they, they, was, they had so much faith, they were carrying their iPhone. Well, that's a wallet, that's an iPhone. They wouldn't even put the iPhone aside because now they have peer pressure to believe that they can walk on water. They had their phone with them and everybody agreed, one, two, three, to step into the pool with all their expensive iPhone and watches and whatever. Guess what happened? Oh, you guessed it. Mommy and Daddy will have to buy new iPhones for them. It didn't happen. Don't follow the things that Jesus did. Follow how He thought when He was on earth and therefore now you know how He thinks when He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Are you here? You know, in the Philippines, some many of you are from Philippines, during Easter time, a lot of people crucify themselves, yes? Right? They physically nail themselves on the cross. They say, Jesus did it, and therefore I need to nail myself on the cross. Number one, He never called you to. Number two is that you are not given the grace to change the world and lead a movement of 2,000 years with billions of people, okay? You're not called to do that, so you're not given the grace to do that, so therefore, don't crucify yourself. Don't be silly. Don't follow what Jesus did. What he did on the cross was for you and it is finished. Don't try to repeat it. It's done deal. Follow how he thought and therefore how he thinks right now. You read the scripture to understand how your God thinks. And you think like him, therefore you will think like God. When you think like God, everything around you will change. That's what we want to do, is think like how God thinks. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your comfort. Thank you, Lord, for revelation. Thank you, Lord, for freedom. Thank you, Jesus, that you have not left us as orphan, but you have left us with your Holy Spirit and with your word so we do not walk in this world blind, that we can follow you, how you think, how you behave, that we can be truly your follower, not follower of man, follower of Jesus. 
And I pray for that revelation to continue to become brighter and brighter in our spirit, every single one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.